African heads of state and government officials on March 21, 2018, signed the framework to establish the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. The agreement is an agreement advanced by the African Union that would create the largest free trade area in the world and is one of the flagship projects of the AU Agenda 2063. Here's a report by my colleague Alfredo Kante. The African Union envisioned the free trade zone on the entire continent with a combined gross domestic product of at least $2.3 trillion. By integrating economies and reducing trade barriers such as tariffs, some countries have expressed the fear of goods being dumped on their markets, leading to a collapse of local industries. Lead coordinator of the Africa Policy Trade Center at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, Dr. David Luke, says those fears have been addressed. The vast opportunities offered by the African continental free trade area do not seem to have percolated to venture capital firms in Africa and other parts of the world. In this respect, we make another call to you to change this institute of affairs. We encourage you to interest venture capital funds in Africa and other parts of the world to seize the opportunities offered by the African continental free trade area. Ethiopian agroeconomist Dr. Demise Chinyalo says the agreement must prioritize agribusiness. Even within the agriculture domain in the biggest complex system, we ignore livestock totally. But the dictionary never forgot about it. The dictionary always tells you agriculture is crop, livestock, as well as business. It's business. It's where actually the macroeconomist policy formulation also missed it. The statistics on agriculture seem to ignore the component of agriculture in its entirety that it has in services. The Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement aims to increase employment prospects, living standards, and opportunities for Africa. Alfred Okansi, TV3 News, Addis Ababa. All right, so that was a report filed by my colleague Alfredo Kante about a month ago in Addis Ababa where uh, the forum was held to discuss trade and other matters arising. Uh, so the big question is, is Ghana ready to compete uh, for the single trade market with other African countries? Uh, I've been joined in the studio by uh, Luis Yao Afo. He's a stakeholder uh, with uh, the coalition. Uh, could you help me with the, the name of the coalition, please? Trade Facilitation. Trade Facilitation okay. Foundation for Ghana. Right. Alfred um, Luis Yao Afo. Thank yeah. You. Thank you very much, sir, for your time. Uh, Emmanuel Bensai is also representative with the ECOWAS business. And then also uh, Zaid Hamui is with Borderless Alliance also uh, a member of the coalition. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your time, and good to have you, you, you in Thank studios. You uh, so I know you've been championing this course uh, to have Ghana host the Secretariat for the African Free Trade um, Agreement. I'll start off with, um, I'll start off with you, uh, Yao. So why is this such a big deal? It is. Like, you know, we've had a lot of single markets. The European Union is one, whereby a lot of exports going out of Africa. Now Africans want to have intra-African trade so that we reduce the export ratios, whereby you have a lot of, you know, a lot of losses when you calculate the export ratios that is going outside from Africa. Now the total GDP, if we are to do integration into trade, is going to be around 2.5 trillion. For you to know. Kenya is 3.4 trillion. About 3.4 trillion, yeah. Trillion dollars. Yeah. And like I said, that is going to be more than the size of the Indian GDP. Mm. And if that is so, it makes us about the eighth largest economy in the world. Then again, one important thing is that we just have to identify markets. Mm. It enables us to identify markets among ourselves and then build upon our comparative advantages. And so it's very important. You have your, you, it reduces your budget, uh, you know, um, balance of payment deficits when you do much more among yourselves. It opens up for free movement of goods, free movement of services, and create employment. Mm. Because you can take your skills anywhere of, to Africa mm. once this um, um, policy is into implementation. All right, uh, Ziad, so we're looking at a population of nearly 1.2 billion and a cumulative gross domestic product of uh, about $3.4 trillion. I'll ask you the same question. Why is it such a big deal? It is important because 
countries like Ghana, which are leading the, the, the way for manufacturing and industrialization, who also have an opportunity to export into larger markets. And here, let us clarify something that trade does not necessarily mean imports. Trade has to do with exports, it has to do with transit, it has to do with import. And of course, the premise of the Continental Free Trade Agreement is that you need to have a viable manufacturing base in order to export these products that you are producing in a particular country across the, the, the African continent. And uh, you have asked uh, earlier whether Ghana is prepared. Mm -hmm. It is, I would say, yes or no, maybe, because, <laughs> I'll tell you why. It depends on uh, two important uh, criterion. First of all, the, the trade facilitation agreement, the continental free trade agreement, has already entered into force. And so it does not really uh, uh, matter whether a particular country X or Y is ready or not. It is there and we need to deal with it. So whether Ghana is ready, whether Ghana is not ready, or whether Ghana is uncertainly ready is a different matter altogether. Mm -hmm. The question here has to deal with the acceleration of the industrialization efforts of particular countries in Africa. Ghana has made the highest level of political commitment towards hosting the Secretariat of the Continental Free Trade Agreement. And that gives you uh, uh, at least an indicative of the decision or the will of the leaders of this country to, co to transform Ghana into a leader in doing business mm. and in, in industry across Africa. Mm. And the Continental Free Trade Agreement is the key mm. to allow us access into wider markets. All right, Mr. Benson, I know you also, uh, you know, have been championing the cause for this to take off, and particularly for Ghana to host uh, the Secretariat. Uh, mm -hmm. We needed about 22 countries to sign on to this. We've mm -hmm. had 24 uh, essentially sign on to it. Mm -hmm. um, in the lead up to this, what were some of the challenges that we had to go through? Well, some of the challenges had to do with uh, some of the larger economies like uh, South Africa and Nigeria. Um, now, we now know uh, um, that some of the reasons were internal. Uh, Nigeria, for example, had an issue to do with the thing rolling too fast for them. They were, they were not prepared uh, in, in actually preparing their own national, you know, their, own, their national stakeholders, precisely, that's the word, on, on how the whole thing would pan out. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, talk from civil society within the country about you know some of the challenges that they would have. So and and also Nigeria had elections, so needed to deal with that as well. Needed mm -hmm. to walk the fine line of you know who who is going to take over? Is it still going to be you know Buhari who would stay or another leader? And all that would have implications for for where Nigeria. Uh, South Africa was a, a different case. South Africa. Uh, just wasn't ready at the time, but but over you know over the course of the uh, past couple of months, it, it uh, demonstrated explicit you know interest that finally they were ready. Mm -hmm. uh, so these were w w the the concern. I mentioned these two countries because um, Nigeria is one of the larger economies, mm -hmm. and as we know, mm -hmm. as is South Africa. So mm -hmm. everyone has been talking, and in different corners, people have been saying, "Well, Nigeria is not really part of the agreement now, mm -hmm. so can it take off?" And some of us are saying, "Well." Uh, you know, it has to take off. It's already running, you know, and, you know, if Nigeria wants to catch on later, sure, it can come, you know, it can join the train. But the continental free trade area, as they had rightly said, is, has taken off. Mm. Uh, and, and so that, that, that seems to be, for me, it's an artificial challenge mm. because whatever we do, the thing is in motion. Mm. And so we need to adapt our realities, national mm. economies and so on, to adjust to it and be prepared for it, you know, build our capacity to be able to respond to, to, to how the continental free trade area will, will benefit uh, all of us and mm. our economies. Uh, Louise, uh, mm. so we're looking at a population of 1.2 billion mm. and uh, a cumulative uh, GDP of nearly $3.4 trillion, which you say is uh, almost uh, can, can be likened to yeah. that of the Indian economy. Yeah. I mean, the question for us here in Ghana is what's in it for us? Essentially means there's no protectionism policy that's going to be, you know... Uh, uh, the, the policy actually mm. gives about 90% tax trade-offs. Mm. That is tax trade-off. And they have 10% exclusives. Mm. Now, it was divided into three economies among the continental free trade. We have the big, the, the large, the medium, and the small. Mm. The large economies, like, you know, uh, Green Ghana is part of them. 
they are going to... You know, Nigeria is also very large economy. Right. Those economies are going to go strictly with the 90% tariffs off. Mm. Then there's least economies like, you know, you go to Mozambique and all those things. They, for some time, will not adopt the 90% tariff. Mm. And what is in for Ghana is that it's about market identification. Mm. In other words, as we are going to involve with export and imports, especially exports, because we are going to trade among ourselves, mm. what is important is that um, businesses in Ghana, startups, SMEs, what have you, can start now looking for the markets. In other words, you have to now start identifying what product will be good for what kind of market. Mm. I'll give an example. Mm. In Ethiopia, mm. if, for instance, there are some startup business like aluminium producing this um, uh, utensils, it's a, it's, it's a big market in Ethiopia. Mm. So you have identified the market. You, you go on that product. Again, if you go to a country like, let me tell you, let's say Seychelles. Seychelles import a lot of butter, even from Brazil. So if I identify a market like Seychelles for butter, instead of then going to Brazil to import, I start preparing myself. Kinte is a very good product, loved in South Africa. Mm. And Ghana has a lot of mm. uh, upcoming startup businesses, even already there, for that kind of uh, an market. So what do you do? You just begin to expand. You look for the market. And Will this also affect the currency? The currency, though, uh, we, it's even the agenda 2063 of EU is mm. even looking forward for single markets. Right. Uh, I mean, single, single currency. currency the the other issue is the comparative mm. advantage. Mm. That's the, 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 the basis. Right? Compa what are you stronger in building? What are you stronger in adding value? W will the larger economies not be exposed then? No, like I said, it's 90% tariffs off. It is an agreement. Okay. So, currency issue, it's. 50-50, uh, mm. but uh, it's it's false part of it. It's all protected mm -hmm. within. Mm. You know, uh, the, uh, the 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 agreement is not to marginalize any economy. Mm. Neither is it to you know uh, boost up any uh, currency. Mm. What we are fighting against, or what we are trying to look out to, is bring down the sh the forex shocks mm. that we all have when we are trading the dollar. Mm -hmm. Okay, the U.S. dollar. And obviously, the, the dominance the of dominance, the Western well, world. So among mm. ourselves. Mm. You look at African currencies, mm. yeah, they are doing well, but you know. Kindly hold on for me. There is a question about modalities with respect to this agreement. Uh, we have captured this in a report. We'll be back shortly. 22 African countries have ratified the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, with 52 out of the 55 member states signing the agreement a year after it was promulgated. Director of Internal Audits and Evaluation Operations at the ECOWAS Bank for Investment and Development, Ulagunji Moses Ashimolowo says, the Free Trade Area Agreement will expand funding opportunities for Africa to add value to raw materials produced on the continent. Assistant Commissioner, Customs Division of the Ghana Revenue Authority, Seidu Yakubo, indicated that the ECOWAS Common External Tariff Regime will enhance the advantages in the agreement for countries in the sub-region. Customs will again facilitate trade by allowing goods originating from member states to enter other member states without payment of import duty. Once we say it's a free trade area, but the modalities have to be set clear. As of now, to help the administration, customs administrations in Africa collect the AU levy. The African Economic Outlook 2019 provides evidence of growing cooperation in several areas, lending credence to the need for the Free Trade Area Agreement. So clearly this is likely to be very beneficial to SMEs in particular. But, but the big question is, will the modalities be obeyed and will it be well spelled out? Every implementation has a big problem when it's from the start. Mm. But gradually, it's, it's into a stage whereby once it has been ratified by everybody, everybody should bind them by what? Mm. You know, it is actually heading towards a, a, a common border, a common customs union uh, kind of uh, integration. Mm. So basically, once you have ratified, you are bound by what you have. Ziad, what's the role of Borderless Alliance in all this? Well, Borderless Alliance has started promoting regional economic integration and the free movement of goods and people in Ghana since its inception back in 2012. So trade facilitation for us is a way of living. We firmly believe that by integrating the economies of smaller countries, you become more resilient. You build bigger markets. You create more opportunities for smaller and larger companies. Mm. But I think 
And I think for, for us, when the trade facilitation agreement of the World Trade Organization set in after 2014, but then later on the con African Continental Free Trade Agreement, we thought it was just a much larger uh, see, uh, uh, theater for the same ideas actually, promoting the free movement of goods and people and services and finances across a wider area in order to aggregate markets, in order to leverage resources, in order to manage to, cre uh, to uh, create larger opportunities uh, for players to benefit from. Um, Lewis was talking earlier about uh, planning accordingly. And I think also most of the doubts surrounding the African Continental Free Trade Agreement have to do with fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. You might be aware, for example, that many of the African countries at the moment have not built their 10% exclusion list yet. We're talking about the 90% duty free. But so far, as we were speaking, Ghana included, many countries in Africa so far have not prepared the list of strategic products or the list of uh, exclusion lists Jesus. based on which to negotiate. And I think everybody's eyes now is turned towards Niamey for the first week of July, where the operationalization of the Continental Free Trade Agreement will begin in earnest. Mm. I think the approach with the agreement was that, first of all, let us get the political will, the goodwill of the various countries to actually create that kind of common area for all. Which we've gotten. Which we have gotten mm. to. And it seems at times as if we got there too fast for some of the decision makers to react mm. appropriately or for some of the knowledge and the uh, stakeholder engagements to trickle down onto the layman. And you will notice that many of the laymen at the moment have the fear of the unknown because mm. they, feel, uh, they fear that their country might become a dumping ground for certain products. Absolutely. And then you have smaller com uh, companies which are afraid of bigger companies coming in and wiping out their share. It's, it's not as simple as that, right? There are many, th there are different uh, uh, mechanisms at play. And if we play our cards right, we mm. can actually transform this into an opportunity uh, I'm for going smaller to come back companies. To Mr. Benzer, have we learned a lot, I mean, from the EU itself and the challenges it's had to go through over the years, you know, coming together as a common front to trade among itself? There should, certainly should be lessons for us to be learning from them. Uh, yes, uh, as far as the EU is concerned, one, one of my um, biggest problems has always been what one academic called uh, integration snobbery. Um, that is to say that using the EU solely as an example of how regional integration should work. Regional integration um, done as the African Union has expressed it through, you know, back in 63 all the way up to the way we see now has gone through a the number of evolution. different challenges mm -hmm. and evolutions. It used to be the OA, you now mm -hmm. it's the African Union. And so, yes, the EU is held up as a model. But even the EU has had its own and fair of challenges. challenges. Right. We know mm -hmm. with the euro and, 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 mm -hmm. and even the, the, the different track mm -hmm. tracks that the EU has gone through. And that's what we should be learning from them. Uh, well, the, well uh, is there anything to learn from? Because I think... In terms of the challenges, so we do not walk that path. Well, well let's, let's look at... Let's even take the case of the euro. Mm -hmm. We know that the euro got to where it is. When we recall the Greek crisis back in 2015, 2016, yeah. mm -hmm. the, we now know that the, the Greeks cooked the books mm -hmm. in the sense that they they changed the figures so that they could be part of the, uh, you know, the, the project of the euro. Mm. And the same, there were similar discussions about how Italy had also done that in the EU as well. And so the EU, euro had always been standing on fragile legs. That's why countries like the UK decided to opt out and have right. its own currency. Right. So uh, in retrospect, we can say that there are lessons. But the thing is that, uh, you know, we haven't yet gotten to the, uh, in, in, as far as Africa's integration is concerned, we're not yet gone to a common currency. But in and we're not honesty, even talking about that. In all honesty, has yeah. this come too little too late? No, it's not too little. This is actually in fulfillment. Let, let, let's also situate some of the things in context. There have been earlier efforts. No, no, th this, is, this is on the right track mm. because, you see, the African Continental Free Trade Area is in fulfillment of what the African Union has, which is called the Abuja Treaty. The Abuja Treaty uh, talks about continental integration in six steps, three regional, three continental. Mm. This is the, the third stage, the fourth stage, where after this continental free trade area and we sort out the modalities, mm. we will have a continental customs union and then eventually a whole common market, a whole common market. And it's also a fulfillment of Agenda 2063, which is mm. the AU's landmark right. project. So, so we're on the right track. Mm. And it's actually come a lot 
uh, earlier than recovery because faster. if you faster because mm. if you recall even 2015 mm. we had the tripartite free trader and mm. i think the media talked about it i remember 2015 the of commerce the common market for economic in southern africa east african community and sadex southern african they came out with the tripartite free trade area mm. Mm. Uh, in 2015 and that was the precursor for this continental free trader mm. so i think we're on track as, uh, as Africa of actually getting somewhere with our integration. And we are looking at scale and we're saying that what better way to really deepen our integration than to have scale through things like the Continental Free Trader, which will allow us to be able to build our companies, small and medium sized enterprises, to the point that finally we can compete with the US and we can compete at the WTO as a block. Uh, because we have, you know, this common market where, you know, Africans are able to finally now be able to trade among themselves. Mm. So, so, so we all agree amongst ourselves that yeah. this is a real good policy. It will help in the drive towards regional integration and all of, of yeah. that. But there's also another leg to it, which has to do with who hosts the secretariat. Yes. And that's what a lot of you here are championing. I'll come back to you yeah. uh, because you have predicted that Ghana is likely to win the, the hosting sure. right. Uh, uh, but let's just... Uh, you know, take this response to another very pertinent concern, which has to do with free trade and the fact that it may not, after all, be free. Uh, <laughs> you know, let's take a listen to the director in charge of audits at the ECOWAS Bank of Investment, and he's been explaining a, a bit of, uh, you know, what this really means to us. Analysts have projected that by 2030, Africa may emerge as a $2.5 trillion potential market for households consumption and $4.2 trillion for business-to-business -business consumption. The Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement would result in a unified market of over 1.2 billion people. Creating one African market is expected to prioritize goods and services, invariably leading to the creation of job opportunities. Director of Internal Audit and Evaluation Operations at the ECOWAS Bank for Investment and Development, Olagunju Moses Ashimolowo, said the Free Trade Area Agreement will expand funding opportunities for Africa to add value to raw materials produced on the continent. The bank's mandate is to assist in financing developmental projects in all the 15 countries in the ECOWAS subregion, Ghana inclusive. Here in Ghana, as at December 2018, we have not less than $100 million investment in various sectors of the economy, hospitality, infrastructure, energy, agro-transformation, name it. Chief Executive Officer of Rescue Shipping, franchise holders of Ghana International Trade Conference, lead local partner of the conference, believes the private sector will be a major player to the success of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. Ghana International Trade and Finance Conference has become an annual conference in Ghana that brings together business professional executives, that brings together finance experts to come and inform um, um, a business community, to come and, 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 and display opportunities that lies within the Ghanaian economy and the Ghanaian community to these business persons. And so this is what informs the annual conference in Ghana. But this year we decided to do it in partnership with the Ethiopian Embassy here in Ghana and also the Addis Ababa Chamber of Commerce in Ethiopia. After the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement comes into force, there's a likelihood that there will be a new round of discussions about creating institutions that foster dialogue, monitor compliance and provide technical assistance. All right, so we're back in the studio. You're still watching Business Focus, your weekly business and economic analysis program live here on TV3. Today we're discussing the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and uh, already there are, you know, there are predictions that Ghana uh, may go ahead to host the Secretariat uh, here. Uh, a lot of countries have also uh, thrown in the bid. Uh, it's now been narrowed down to two and we're doing a bit of analysis as to whether or not, you know, what's in it for us as a country, what this is likely to potent for us in terms of uh, investment within the, 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 the African continent. Uh, let me come back to you, uh, Louis. So I was asking you about um, Ghana eventually winning the right to host the Secretariat here. What are the chances? The chances are that for, from where I stand, the, in terms of the democratic credentials, we said peace environment, we satisfied that criteria. Number two, I've been following the footsteps of the president in a way since early of this early, early this year, and I realized that he's a bit smart because you know the president. I heard about the French, uh, you know, adopting French 
as a kind of a, a course, a curriculum course. Mm. And I said to myself, I know the president is touring somewhere because for you to host, you are going to have to welcome other f uh, Francophone countries mm. having their missions here. And so it's important that you, you'll be able to take their kids to schools that teach French or make French a kind of a dominant language policy. So the, friend, the president to that direction. And then also the infrastructure. We have, the, I think Ghana earmarked the World Trade Center. We have the Export Trade Center as the office for earmarked if we win. And so the, the team that came went to inspect the facility there. Then again, uh, they're looking at also accommodation just within the Accra because some of these you know, foreign nations would like to be within. And then schools. I also went to Ghana, National, Ghana International School <laughs> to go and you know, survey the facilities there. So all these things are not just because they came to, it's part and forms part that we are ready. I think Ghana qualified in all these areas. We, one thing that I kept saying, we got the number of housing units, you know, the number of housing units around where the office has been earmarked is my, my, my problem, whether we're going to have more, but it's open rooms for more estate developers who are around mm. to also come in. Mm. You know, so, so Louise, you've talked about what we stand to benefit. Uh, Ziad, what do we stand to, to lose? Well, I was uh, just looking at an earlier uh, press release that we've done on behalf of the Trade Facilitation Co uh, Coalition for Ghana in support of the uh, bid of Ghana to host the Secretariat. And there, there is a particular statistic which uh, draw our attention and we included. And it has to do with what's to gain versus what's to lose in nominal terms. There's this study that was done by UNCTAD, mm. I think a couple of years ago, late two years ago, about what would the full implementation of the agreement generate in additional revenue. And mm. then it was thought that it would generate between 10.7 billion US dollars and 16.1 billion dollars in welfare gains across Africa and an increase between 24% and 33% in intra-Africa trade. And that has to do with, uh, depending on which scenario eventually takes place, whether a full implementation by all of the countries mm -hmm. or a partial implementation by some of the countries, mm -hmm. hence the variation. So these are the likely permutations. So mm -hmm. the, the, this is the variation mm -hmm. uh, that was estimated and calculated mm -hmm. by UNCTAD. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 a, benef a welfare gain between 10.7 billion US dollars and 16.1 billion versus a loss of tariff revenue between 3.2 billion and 4.1 billion. So in order to have an, your omelette, you have to break some eggs. Yeah. And if you compare the figures, mm -hmm. you have to say that you have to, you're eventually, in layman's term, you have to spend between 3.2 and 4.1 in order to gain 10.7 to 6.1. Mm -hmm. And in the business term, if you spend 3 and you get 10, it's a good so investment. So eggs won't be uh, costly after all. <laughs> well, you have to, exactly. Well, uh, street sellers will have to break the eggs in order to make the sandwich, and it will cost them some tempest, so or they'll mm. make one CD, and then they'll make their profit. Mm. Now, they can look at the cost it takes them to make the sandwich. Mm. They might decide that it's too expensive for them to run the business and shut down mm. without looking at the long-term benefit. Mm. And here we're trying to be uh, visionary. We're trying to look into the future of this continent mm. of 1.2 billion today. Hold it there. I'll give Ben to the final word. What do you see in the future, that future that he's trying to look into? What do you say? I see the future that I was actually about to talk about. You see it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, which is to say that it's a future in which every single African is content to be, to be living on, 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 on the continent where they're able to set up their own businesses, knowing that there is scale because there are institutions like the continental free trade area mm -hmm. and there are attendant things like, you know, the open air, uh, African skies and Agenda 26, all these other things that will come alongside this as well. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing for, for, for us as a coalition is the fact that the opportunities that will accrue to Africans, mm -hmm. knowing that they can send, the, uh, you know, uh, do business from West Africa to East Africa to Southern Africa, a lot more freely than than before and that they won't have the WTO coming in to dictate the terms and all these other trade wars that we've been hearing with mm. Trump and China and so on we'll be able to overcome that because yeah. we have a larger market now Very and finally nice. Africans can finally relax and get to work on building the continent as as should have been a long time ago. Mm. All right, so we'll wait yeah. and see what happens. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining me in studio. Ziad uh, Hamwe is a national president, uh, the executive director for Tazan Enterprise Limited, and also with Borderli Borderless Alliance, right? Uh, also, thank you very much, Luis Yao, 
Afo, he is a stakeholder with the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, and also Emmanuel Bensa, also a representative with the ECOWAS business. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time, and good to Thank have you in the nice. studio. You're still watching your most authoritative business and economic analysis program live here on TV3. This is Business Focus. We're going to take a short break. When we return, uh, you know, inspections carried out by the Ghana Standards Authority, we know have exposed 10 fuel filling stations engaged in under delivering they include shell motorway extension to tau uh, mccarthy hill goyle mile 11 uh, framed oil tetegu junction goyle a lot of these uh, companies have come up uh, they've actually been uh, penalized uh, there's some news coming in at the moment we'll take a shot but when we tell we'll bring you all the very latest here on business focus Right, so welcome back to your most authoritative business and economic analysis program live here on TV3. This is Business Focus. We're streaming live on Facebook. You can also join us with your views, comments, and suggestions on any of our top stories uh, this hour. Now, inspections carried out by the Ghana Standards Authority have exposed 10 fuel filling stations engaged in under delivering. They include Shell, the motorway extension, uh, the Total McCarthy Hill, Gull Mile 7, Frames Oil, and a number of uh, other filling stations. Now, a statement issued by the authority and copy to TV3 said in addition, two companies, the Galaxy Oil, uh, Spintex Road, and Agape on the Spintex Road had broken the standards authority uh, seal without permission. Now, this story, uh, which broke last week, uh, received a lot of attention with uh, especially COPEC raising concerns about uh, the punitive measures uh, taken against the perpetrators. Uh, we're going to be staying a while longer on the story because it's developing. A number of angles are, are you know, are coming up. Uh, let me just go live on the phone line now to speak to Duncan Amwa. He is with the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, uh, COPEC. Duncan, thank you very much for your time. So what really is your concern at the moment? Um, let me say good evening to you, good evening to your viewers. Uh, well, where we are is a situation where we need to go a bit deeper uh, rather than just criticizing and uh, castigating these stations that were caught uh, probably doing the wrong thing. The question then again is, are there any things that probably would uh, be pushing some of these stations uh, to act either unlawfully or to even cheat the entire public. Uh, these are issues that I'm sure in the course of the week we'll be communicating uh, via a press conference. But as I speak to you, our checks still continue uh, with the various stations in and around uh, the country to ascertain uh, whether indeed uh, they are complying uh, with the minimum standards of fuel delivery or indeed uh, people are still being shortchanged. Those are things we would like to get to the bottom of. But again, uh, some other issues arise as to whether indeed uh, issues such as uh, temperature uh, variation, temperature differences are actually being taken care of. Or indeed, we just go to the station, uh, do our own calibration, and start finding them. We need to get to the bottom of these matters, and I'm sure that uh, in the course of the week, uh, we'll put something together to inform the public. Uh, adequately. Uh, Duncan, are you suggesting that these fuel stations that have been cited for wrongdoing have a justification for uh, the acts uh, that they perpetrated? Uh, all I'm trying to say is this. Uh, people sometimes do the right thing, sometimes they do the wrong thing. Whichever way it goes, we should be able to find a lasting solution such that we wouldn't even come back to this ever again. Uh, if the NTA grants license to all stations, it is presumed and expected that uh, these stations would at least be working uh, with a certain minimum in mind. If they go below the minimum, what do we do to ensure that going below the minimum does not shortchange uh, the unsuspecting public? And so we are committed to getting to the bottom of this in order to find a more lasting solution uh, such that we wouldn't come back to this uh, phenomenon uh, again next year. Uh, what's the role of the National Petroleum Authority in ensuring that they, they do the right things? Uh, well, the NPA equally has a, a role uh, in ensuring that petroleum uh, delivery and supplies in and around the country uh, meet a certain minimum. Uh, unfortunately, this exercise uh, seems to have been a one-sided one that came from the Standards Authority who only go 
uh, in there to check uh, for calibrated, you know, uh, devices, the machines that they are working with. One thing that the NPA clearly needs to set up on has to do with the issue of temperature variation. Uh, indeed, if you load a product that is 30 degrees, uh, you would expect that the warm product would be more. When the product settles at the station, will the dealer in the end just have to lose and there's no compensation? Indeed, if we don't address these challenges, what we will be doing is that we'll be pushing all these dealers to the wall. Uh, they suffer all these uh, uh, poor losses or what we call apparent losses. There's no compensation. The losses become uh, bad debts on their books. And in the end, if you are not careful and you push them, what you are asking for is for them to pass it on to the consumer. So the NPA also clearly uh, has a role to play in here, and we are committed to ensuring that these issues come to the fore to ensure that the NPA also sets up and ensure that whatever temperature losses that accrue or occur to these uh, dealers, uh, they should be compensated for in order that they do not come back to pass it on. Uh, to you and I, the unsuspecting consumer. It's refreshing hearing you talk about the role of the National Petroleum Authority. Now, what about the, the consumers, which you represent, that the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers? Because, I mean, consequently, uh, the consumer is the one at a loss. How do they know uh, that the wrongs that have been perpet uh, perpetrated by these uh, fuel filling stations? Uh, I can only uh, advise uh, the millions of consumers across the country uh, to ensure that if you have a particular station that you frequent, uh, you would know at least how much goes into your fuel tank. If you do switch station and you are having to buy more when fuel prices haven't gone up, then clearly uh, you should have every cause uh, to ask a thing. And we are saying people should now start demanding for receipts when they buy fuel. Again, where in doubt insist the 10 liter can from the fuel station because it is mandatory that every single fuel station in Ghana should keep and have a 10 liter can uh, such that these disputes and doubts when they occur can be resolved. If you do ask and these stations tell you they do not have the 10 liter can, uh, it is a violation. And I am expecting that in the coming days, uh, we would have numbers displayed across every single station one of the NPA, two of the GSA, and three maybe COPEC, so that when consumers right. have a challenge in particular station, uh, people can move in there uh, and ensure that these issues do not traverse uh, beyond just a day or two and uh, go into the month just to short change. Uh, all right, all right, Duncan, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Duncan Amwa is the Executive Director of the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers. Uh, uh, joining us on the phone lines to give his own perspective to the latest uh, happenings between the uh, the standards authority as well as some uh, fuel filling stations now on our mover segment tonight what does it really mean to start a business with practically nothing well 25 year old jacinta chairman sets up the breakfast boutique with virtually nothing and is already receiving orders every day her story will inspire you Breakfast is the most important meal of the day, so it's worth the effort to eat a healthy one. It is also advisable to start your day right by having breakfast. We are still placing premium on young entrepreneurs and their businesses, and that's the main motive of the Mover segment on Business Focus. And today, the Mover train brings us to Hacho. And Hacho, uh, Jacinta Trem stays here, and she's the CEO of a Breakfast Boutique. And so, join me, let's do this together. Let's go. Jacinta is already at the gate, so. Let's just. Good morning, Jacinta. How are you? Yeah, good to have you here. Okay. Mm, thank you. 25 year old Jacinta Treme decided to surprise a friend with a present on his birthday by packaging some few items. According to Jacinta, he loved it so much as well as colleagues who worked with him. Well, the kind of family that I, I come from, most of them, they are just lawyers and doctors. So. Initially, when I was starting this thing, I was getting a lot of um, feedback from my family that, uh, especially, I, I, I remember a time that my mom told me that, ah, 
I'm done with my service and why am I doing business? Because it's stressful. But then I told her that this is what I love to do more. Because while I was doing my service, I was even doing this thing, so I prefer doing the business than wearing an office dress and you know, being in an office. And she was like, okay. And sometimes to friends, initially, you know, Ghana, when you're starting something, it's very difficult. People don't get the concept from the scratch. But whilst you are going, they would, they would understand that, okay, this is what you were trying to mean initially, yes. That gave Jacinta a business plan with little effort, she managed to set her breakfast boutique. Sometimes I consider some of my customers. I have the the normal price range, but then when you call me and you talk to me, oh maybe my money is in 150, and I would like to do something for someone. I do them. Yes, I've done it several for people. Yes. Though young, Breakfast Boutique continues to receive orders virtually every day. For Jacinta, social media has come in handy to boost her business. Someone once told me that George, George Quailing, you'll be a good husband. Jacinta, what do you think? <laughs> I'll be a good husband. And look at this. Am I not a good husband? Any business faces challenges at a point in time, if not every time. She has got few traders at the various markets she deals with who provide her all the items for her business. The Ministry of Business Development has announced that some allocation of funds has been made to support entrepreneurs in Ghana. And uh, I believe Jacinta is in the right position to benefit from that very fund. Yeah. Jacinta. Do you think government is doing its best to support entrepreneurs in Ghana? You think so? I don't think so. You don't? Why? Why? Okay, personally, I, I don't know, but then I feel those, those funds will be given to those that I know. Yeah, and that, that, yeah that's like, like it's become more like a cliche. I you know that I understand, I understand, but let's hope that maybe at least some. 10 million B will come your way. Amen. <laughs> to support your business. Amen. Yeah, sure, sure. Feedback Jacinta attests have also helped shape the business a lot, especially when they are constructive. She encourages the youth to chase their passion. There are a lot of ideas or concepts, something that you can come up with. Just sit down, relax, look at your strength, things that you are very good at, then you just start it. Because I was thinking after my service, I'll get, I'll be employed at where I was, but then we, none of us had the chance to be employed, so I just came up with this thing and I said, and it's working. So what I would like to tell them is that they should keep trying, think of something that is very creative and they'll just, they'll just get there. Well, today I've decided not to satisfy your curiosity by not eating. You see, I didn't eat today. <laughs> I didn't, you see, I didn't eat today. Well, you know, Jacinta wants a favor from government. He wants government to, you know, support entrepreneurs like her to boost her business. By so doing, she can, you know, produce on a larger scale. So a package like this that is going for 250, you might be getting it for 200 cities. And also, she can also be employing more hands. And that, in a way, is also going to tackle unemployment in the country. It's been a fruitful discussion, but. I must say, if you're thinking of surprising a loved one, your girlfriend, your mother, your father, uh, your boyfriend, anything, just go into social media. You know, they produce breakfast for conferences, any party. The handle is Breakfast Boutique GH9. So the contact details are there. Just contact her for that surprise uh, package. We came to you from Hacho here at Accra. Thanks for watching. It's always a pleasure coming your way with this very segment. My name is Josh Crane. I don't say much. I'm black and proud. All right, you're welcome back to Business Focus, your most authoritative business and economic <laughs> analysis program live here on TV3. Now, uh, just for your attention, uh, some major financial stocks have taken a beating up to the announcement of 387 microfinance companies uh, revoking their licenses. That announcement that came uh, sometime two weeks ago by the Central Bank. Uh, Winston Saki, if you to join me. Winston, tell us exactly what's happened. Okay, so, you know, the microfinance sector is linked to savings and loans and then the commercial bank. So when the news came in, I think what happened was investors got a bit jittery. So 
they started offloading their financial stocks mm -hmm. and that is why we saw prices going down we also saw that total also lost a lot because of the current conditions of uh, crude oil prices on the market so the prices are falling and normally when uh, prices of crude oil falls the margins of uh, our petroleum companies also decreases so mm -hmm. that's uh, sort of the reaction we are getting from investors on the market mm. and it's actually hurting the stock market currently All right i'm afraid we've got to leave it here uh, hopefully at uh, same time next week we'll be able to do some more analysis uh, on the commodities market as well and its impact uh, on the local economy we know the price of gold is picking up uh, due to what's happening on the world market thank you very much for watching business focus your most authoritative business and economic analysis program live here on tv3 my name is parkus yasari uh, hopefully next week we'll come your way with yes another edition of this program. Uh, st stay tuned for News 360 with Isa Moni and Natalie Ford.